talking, I'm going to talk about uh, dynamics, the moduli space of curves. And um, if you have been to any of the talks about dynamics and modulus of curves, you know that the talk starts with starts with billiards. <laughs> so, so instead of that, in order to motivate uh, some of the things that I will uh, talk about in the next two lectures, um, I'm going to start with some uh, questions. But um, I'm not going to start with billiards, but we will get there. <laughs> so there's no way. Uh, not talking about billiards. But so I want to talk about three problems. One is just the combinatorial um, slash algebraic problem, which is very elementary, uh, the counting problem, then something about hyperbolic surfaces, and then we talk about billiards. And I want to say how um, the dealing with moduli space of complex curves or hyperbolic surfaces and certain dynamics of certain flows over those will help us. Um, uh, deal with these problems. And um, some parts of the problems are still open, but I just want to talk basically about the connections. And I'll basically mostly talk about the billiard part. So the first problem, the combinatorial one, is um, related to what is what's called meanders. And um, you can draw it. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very simple construction of what is called a meander. With, um, so basically, you have an interval. You have n points on this interval, and imagine you have, or two endpoints, and you have two end circles with the same center. And I have a k, which is fixed. And the other side, so now I have two endpoints, and imagine that the length of all these intervals is one. The other points, you know, if you put, no matter how you put a certain type of circles there, you get closed loops. But what I want to say is that I want to loop, get loops which don't have any self-intersections. And one way of basically producing meanders would be to uh, write 2n, or n, as a1 plus ak. So it is a i of n, n. Somehow, imagine you do it randomly. Or there are different ways of doing it. And then start with maybe uh, you have the first uh, you wrote the number as 4 plus, uh, I don't know, 6 plus 2. Uh, and for each one, do the same thing. Basically, your basic block is uh, two AI points. And you are going to put circles with the same center, one side of this line. So basically, once you do it here, you will get a shape like this. Maybe you want to. Don't push too hard And maybe two. And now the question is, when is what you get? Basically, you get a shape, which is maybe you call it S of A1 to AK. And if it's, you have n points, and then the sum of AIs is equal to n. Uh, when is this, say, connected? So when it's connected, it's ca called a meander. And it's actually it's, it's a very simple thing. What you do is that you just follow these co being connected. You know, you always get union of, uh, let's see, I don't know if this one, it seems that it's, it's connected. <laughs> sometimes it's connected. Sometimes, you know, sometimes they're not connected. And you want to say, well, are they connected? How many connected components do they have? Or what kind of structure? Uh, you get. And, and it's, I mean, you can just figure it out very easily, I think, for the case where k is equal to, but after that, things get quite complicated. But it's a very ba very elementary combinatorial question. Um, is there some a percentage of time? Uh, is there some like c such that uh, among the first c percent of that, that's what by this I mean that as n goes to infinity of uh, uh, of these shapes are connected. Or C0, or what happens as n goes to infinity to all these shapes. So you have all sorts of weird things. And it's basically, if you think about this kind of problems a little bit, it's all, I mean, you, there's a class of problems. You have a 
small piece that, that you have like finitely many, maybe you can divide something into finitely many pieces. For each piece, an integer will give you a pattern. And then the question is, what happens if you glue these patterns together? What do you get? When do you get a connected thing? And you have all sorts of things. Like, or if you like algebraic things, uh, you can easily see that uh, this question is related to uh, getting, starting with uh, the products of uh, per, um, elements in the, like permutations. Imagine A and 1 is bigger than all the Ni's, and you are looking at the permutations in S and 1. Uh, so these are all, one, this is a permutation to the power K1, and all the Ki's are less than Ni's. 2 Ni to the K, this is a product. And now the question is, like, these type of questions are basically you're producing randomly some, uh, some uh, permutations, and you're asking, what is the cycle decompositions? What can you say about the cycle decomposition of these elements? As, like, if ni and ki's are basically, in some sense, random, that n goes n is equal to n1, and then what ki's less than or equal to ni, and uh, n goes to infinity. And uh, I have a list of things, that, that I, references that I don't want to forget. <laughs> and this is an example from a paper by Matthews and Wright. And they show that uh, it's always a cycle decomposition. You can always decompose this as a product of at most uh, R cycles. But OK, so behind all these I mean, these kind of, I mean, you can, you can cook up a lot of like, other combinatorial problems that you want to understand. Basically, you have finitely many, the thing that you get by gluing together finitely many things, and you are asking about the global shape of whatever it is, is connected or not, and they are very, very, very elementary, even more elementary than billiards are, I suppose. And, uh, but behind all these, um, there's always something about surfaces, which is, that's why, how it's related to the, uh, rest of these talks. And um, so maybe this is problem number one. I don't know if the questions are, at least the statements are clear. If, OK. So um, number two will be something about, so now we move about hyperbolic surfaces. So I'm not going to say actually so much about these uh, at the end, but I hope you will see how they are related to the uh, other things that we talk about on about moduli space of curves and the dynamics. <laughs> and um, in the case of hyperbolic surfaces, so you have a hyperbolic surface, you have a surface of genus bigger than or equal to two, or maybe you have some uh, punctures and you have a, a metric of curvature basically minus one, which is complete on your surface. So it can, it's a in case of finite volume, but you can, if you want to think about compact one, uh, that's fine. So you have the upper half plane with the metric uh, dx squared plus dy squared over y squared. And then you have pi 1 of uh, your surface S uh, acts on it isometrically. So you get a hyperbolic surface. And um, so the question is um, about how you can, maybe the genus is too high <laughs> like this for, for this talk. It's OK. So the question is, okay, how, can you <laughs> how, how can you decompose the Okay, there are different ways of you can draw the isotopy class, I mean, homotopy or isotopy classes of curves without self intersection and decompose your surface into what's called pairs of pants. And then the geometry of each piece is basically determined by the length of the, the, uh, the length, which means that the geodesic length of the unique geodesic in that homotopy class. So basically, this is a good way of dealing with. Um, hyperbolic surfaces because the data is in the length of these xi's. And then, so each one, maybe it's x, y, z, the hyperbolic structure inside of this thing is determined just by the length of these <coughs> three curves. And all you have to do is to know something about how you glue these, um, the boundary components. So now we want to see what kind of 
so if you, if you give me the data of the, cur of the lengths of the curves and you tell me how to glue them back, I can, you can construct very easily a lot of hyperbolic surfaces. But um, uh, in fact, you can construct all, all of the marked ones, basically ba by given a combinatorial type of the pants decomposition and the length and the, the way you, you glue the boundary component. But you can ask the question the other one, the, the other way. That is, given x, what if you list uh, the set of all, so it's alpha, the so alpha is a pants decomposition on x, um, or maybe I should say like this, and then you write down length of, the list of lengths of uh, uh, possible pants decompositions there's the six of them there. On, uh, okay, so it reads like this. So the set of all the numbers L alpha one, L alpha six, such that alpha is a pan decomposition on X. So once you fix X, there are different ways of choosing this decomposition. They can get all very long, uh, but um, but the question is, what can we say about the the, the numbers that we get? So what can we say about um, so there are ways of producing these kind of decompositions. They can get all, you know, they are a simple way of doing it. Like if you have a long curve that intersects all of them, you can just twist everything around that curve once. But there are non-trivial ways of uh, producing pants decomposition. So if you have a surface, if you can have a random pants decomposition, which would be very long. Uh, then you say you want to say, oh, okay, what can we say about say the distribution of the distributions of L alpha i divided by F, F alpha j when basically alpha is a random pants decomposition. So, so the reason for that is that <laughs> okay, that's true that given a pants decomposition you can get a surface, but we, we are basically, if you're interested in understanding hyperbolic surfaces, you want to see what kind of pants decomposition do you have on a given hyperbolic surface. You don't want just to glue things, you know, randomly and see like what, I mean, you, you might end up in a, in a completely different surface. Um, so basically, this, this would be a question about what happens fixing a hyperbolic surface. Uh, so at least there is a surface here. This was just combinatorial, but this is surface here and it's a hyperbolic structure on it. But uh, this surface is basically fixed, and you want to understand these combinatorial patterns you draw on them, and you want to understand like the distributions of lengths of them. For example, you would say, is it possible that if if x is given most pants decompositions, basically means, for example, if the sum of the lengths of the curves would go to infinity, is it possible that one of them is actually much larger than the other ones? Or, or are they roughly the same? Or what is the distribution of these numbers that you get if you normalize them by L, which is the sum of the length? OK. So, so this is also something that, uh, even though it's about a given um, hyperbolic surface, um, it's pretty difficult to say. I mean, you can prove some estimates, but it's very difficult to, to prove anything about these kind of questions if you fix x. Um, even though the question is about fixed x, the idea is that even though the, the, so this point is something in this space, so I'll continue, I'll talk about one more question, but this point is in the, you give you a point in the modular space of curves, which is something completely static, but you want to move things around and get some mileage just from how these things behave as you move around in the modular space of curves. But fixing x, um, even though you can get bounds, but I, I don't think, be easy to get uh, strong results about these kind of questions. Okay, so so one more question, which is most of the talk start is more related to the rest of the lecture. So it's somehow I just wanted to mention these problems that you have them in mind and see what uh, just to motivate the rest of the uh, lectures. And finally. Billiard. <laughs> oh, this is the third one. Okay, so I guess you all know the problem, but I will um, uh, just tell you about it again. 
and different types of questions that you can ask about playing billiards in Polygon. And the interesting thing is that the generic question is open. <laughs> so whatever question you ask about, like you, you want to play billiard. First of all, you can play billiard, and you don't necessarily have to play billiard in, in a polygon, but let's assume you do. And OK, there are a lot of things. I mean, some things, <laughs> or, I, I don't want to, yeah. It, I should say that there's no way that I can do justice to all the work which has been done in related things. So I'm just going to talk about uh, the things related to what I've been interested in. So. Uh, maybe I shouldn't say that not much is known about billiards in, in general case. There are many interesting results. But say you start with a polygon, and uh, you're looking at a, the, uh, basically path of a ball bouncing off the edges of the billiard. So this is your billiard and going around. So basically these angles are the same. And then it hits here and the same. And it goes on and on. I don't know. That's this is not a good picture, but it just, I don't know what it does. It goes, continues. So the, you are interested in the basically the, what a ball does um, going around in the, in the polygon. And the, um, they, it, it doesn't have to be convex. It can be concave. It can look like this. And if you don't uh, like playing billiards in the, uh, it's kind of a, a boring polygon. You can even play it in, in something like this and pl plus place an edge here. So you can have this thing going, bouncing around, and then you don't know what happens. So what are the questions that um, are very natural? So you want to see what, what the path of a, this billiard does. Uh, for example, are there? Uh, closed paths. Infinitely many or not. Uh, what can you say about, so the, the length, you know, it's, it's, in, it's sitting in C or in R2. That the length really is something well defined. So the Euclidean length of the path. Uh, and what can you say about the asymptotics of the number of, say, closed paths of length, say, less than or equal to L, as L goes to infinity. And um, are there dense, uh, dense orbits? Uh, are the dense orbits equidistributed? So because it's possible that, so there are two things. Like say, you want to start at the point and go around. The question being dense or not is if you cover the whole billiard eventually. But it's possible that you cover it eventually, but it's not, not in a fair way. A fair way would be that if this space has, if this A has bigger area than B, if you take T, go for a long time, like say T, um, the the amount of time your path spends in A should be divided by the amount of time it, pa it spends in B should be measure. Measure means just Euclidean area, <laughs> you know, the area of A divided by area of B. So is it the same? Are orbits, are the dense orbits, are they equidistributed? Um, and um, uh, yeah, so, so these are some questions. But also there is um, one more question that I want to briefly mention now that I'm sort of bombarding you with problems. Uh, and I may, OK, maybe I should mention, first of all, that if the, or it could be light, you know, it's just light starting from this point and then just going in these directions. And I should say that if, if the ball goes to one of these corners, uh, it just stays there, dies. Just doesn't stop. It goes, there's some hole here in the ball. Goes in, so it's it um, all these things like closed loops, and you know you don't know what direction to continue. It's like all the angles would be the same, and it's um, closed loop would be something uh, like you all know, like this. I guess if you have a oh, bad picture, would be a high school students know that this is there always. You get closed loops in certain triangles like this. The angles are less than five or high. Um, so it's kind of a, so you, you have closed loops not going through. These are singular points in your billiard. Um, 
And so, and there's one more question, I mean, two, two more questions that I want to tell you about. So you want to see the kind of, what, what would orbits do? And there are some problems called, I mean, and I say these, these illumination problems. And blocking problems. Okay, so, um, which are trivial for certain type of uh, billiards, at least the first one. Uh, okay, the second one is not, but um, you basically will have a room which looks like a, I mean, a, this is your room, and uh, you, instead of looking at a ball at billiard, it's like light starting from a point, a light bulb here. And so the light goes in all the directions. And then, so the walls are made of glass, and it hits the wall, and then continues and goes on and on forever. And you want to see, if I give you a billiard and I want to see if you can find, you can put the light somewhere so that the whole room is uh, bright. Uh, okay, so for example, for convex billiards, it's trivial, right? <laughs> so this, the first question is basically um, mostly about the billiards, I mean, it's about billiards which are not convex, otherwise, of course, it's you can draw the line joining the two points, so it's um, it's obvious. Uh, but in, so you are interested in billiards. I mean, it doesn't have a, to be a polygon. polygon but uh, say, if a, if a polygon could look really weird. And in fact, there are um, billiards. Uh, but should make sure that uh, I have all the references. Uh, uh, that there are billiards where which cannot be illuminated by at any from any point polygon billiards, and uh, there are billiards which uh, I mean basically no, they are not polygon billiards, but I mean whenever wherever you put the light, you get dark rooms, dark areas. Not only that some points are not illuminated, but some pieces of the billiard are not illuminated. And the second uh, problem is like you are sitting. Um, uh, I don't know, they are they're called security problems, but <laughs> I don't know. It's like you have a point, you want to choose, you put two points. So the first point is maybe your child trying to escape, <laughs> and this is your iPhone. <laughs> She's trying to reach, and so or light starting from this point A, and then going point B, and you want to block point A from reaching B by finitely many points. <laughs> So assuming that your child only, goes only straight, it <laughs> bounces off the edges. <laughs> but in any case, it's, so it's light starting from A. Can I block B by putting finitely many points, which means any path, there are infinitely many, possibly infinitely many paths from A to B. Imagine that the, your billiard can be illuminated. So can I put finitely many points here so that any path between A and B you put the dad here and the grandma here, maybe it's like the other people. <laughs> so yeah, anyway, going this way um, from A to B, this is not a, such a good picture, will go through one of these uh, points. And of course, this is, I mean, the, you can uh, see there are a lot of things about this by Kane in different contexts. And it's not only about billiards, you can talk about a manifold. Uh, so it makes sense uh, in any. Riemann, manif Riemannian manifolds, or in, in a very general settings, that is, you have two points on a manifold on the surface, and I don't know, and, and then basically you want to see if it's possible to find finitely many points on the surface such that, such that any geodesic going from A to B will have to go through one of these finitely many points. And uh, there are different results about, about these problems. And uh, I should say that. Uh, basically, so, so these are the list of problems from, about billiards, which are somehow related to what we will discuss uh, later today and the rest of the lectures. And um, it's very difficult to say um, anything about an arbitrary even uh, polygon. So there are examples of billiards which cannot be illuminated, but you can say, like, what is the set of points that cannot be illuminated? I don't know. Generically, what happens? What if the boundaries has certain properties? And I'm sure, that, I mean, there are a lot of results, but it's really hard to 
to get to say anything. Um, for example, this question is open uh, for triangles for arbitrary uh, triangle billiards. So there are, I mean, and then there are results. Maybe I should mention by Rich Schwartz and. Uh, Hooper, who say that things about like what happened to the angle if it's a little bit bigger than pi over two, you can find it, and it's it's a difficult problem in the sense that finding the combinatorial patterns of closed orbits is difficult. <laughs> it's really it's, it's a com combinatorial is a very difficult problem, and um, and the other problems are are very difficult too. I mean, uh, nobody knows how to deal with them in many cases, um, but. Um, there is a case which, uh, which is related to dynamics on uh, modular space of curves, which, is, which will give you information about uh, these kind of questions. And that is the case where P is called a rational polygon. So a rational polygon is a polygon whose angles are uh, rational multiples of pi. And all these problems become uh, uh, more somehow approachable. If <laughs> some of them are still open, but you see there is a uh, there's some something to do there. Um, you can get a lot of mileage just by looking at the rational polygons. And unfortunately, there are not so many results about stability of things. It's not like you can estimate the polygon by the rational polygons. You can, but it's very hard to relate them if you try to estimate your polygon with rational polygons. Uh, but um, so why? So I just want to explain why rational polygons are easier to deal with, and uh, and also why they are interesting. Uh, still, they are very interesting. Um, so um, even though it's, it's like a special case, uh, so so why why rational polygons? Maybe the the, the main reason is that um, so if you start from a ball, if you have a ball. A billiard ball in P will have finitely many um, directions. Or maybe I should say the path, an infinite path of billiard ball in P will have finitely many directions. So, so if you start from uh, any kind of polygon, you know, to say you're changing the angle, it's just you look at the the, the structure that you have, like this is uh, vertical and horizontal lines. It makes sense to talk about the angle of a line. And then when you bounce off the edge of the billiard, the angle changes. So basically what you are doing that we will use um, is that uh, basically what you're doing is that you are, con it's as if, I'm sure you have all seen this trick. We you know what you're heading. So you are taking the basically reflection of the triangle or your, your polygon along the edge of your polygon. And instead of looking at the billiard path like this, you're just continuing the straight line. So you can say, OK, so what if I, I have, so for edges, imagine they have the edges of P, which are E1 to En. So each one will define Ri will be just a reflection uh, along EI, then you can look at the, basically, if you start the path, you are looking at, it's OK, so bouncing off of the wall. Basically, what you are doing is that you are acting by the reflection each time. And the group generated by the reflections, so the interesting thing is for rational polygons is that the, the, the group generated by the reflections would be finite in SO2, I guess. Um, so basically, if you start the path, if, if it's, you are in an arbitrary billiard, it's OK. So you start with some angle, and then the angle changes and changes. So you're hitting the, the line with an element of SO2. And the, basically, it's a dense. The group is dense in SO2. You, there's not much you can say. But the rational poly, uh, if you have a rational polygon, then <coughs> sorry, the set of all the uh, directions would be just a finite set. So even though you are going along, continuing, the, the angles are, you're, you have finitely many angles that you can have. So um, things are a little bit um, easier. And uh, 
So, so how do we um, maybe I'll keep this question and this I'll say a little bit about uh, what is known about them. Um, so maybe I'll just say something. I'll, I'll mention the roughly the result. Let's say for illumination problems, small x, okay. and this one. I think maybe the, the, you can find some references there. But uh, still, even if you are in rational polygons, basically um, there are always dense orbits. Uh, but there are orbits which are dense and are not equidistributed. But with, I'll discuss them. And see, you see how they, how how these statements. Uh, there are dense orbits. There are dense orbits which are not equidistributed. You can say bounds. Uh, you can get some bounds about the. Uh, the number of closed orbits of length less than or equal to L, but getting the exact asymptotics is more difficult. It's um, in families. The, mm, what do you mean? If, oh yeah, the, if there's yeah, certainly yeah. You can have infinitely yeah. You can have infinitely many. If it can be just you can have parallel ones, and you are just counting the the ones which are parallel are counted as um, the same thing. I suppose it's like even if you have a billiard, which is a rectangle, you have like all the uh, all these guys are the same. You know, and they are if they are parallel, they are doing the same thing basically. You're counting them as one. Otherwise, you have infinitely many. <laughs> if you have in many cases, if you have one, and um, but they are the exact asymptotics is something um, uh, quite difficult and. Uh, and the illumination problems are uh, also somehow uh, not, uh, not so easy. I mean, in some cases, one can show that the, the generically, for a generic, whatever means, rational polygon, things are, um, you can illuminate basically every rational polygon. Uh, but there are examples of, I mean, there are very easy examples of uh, rational polygons that you cannot illuminate. But uh, in these cases, all the things that are known is like if you put A, there are finitely many points uh, B that you can, you cannot cover. It's, uh, that's all you can't cover, and you will cover the rest of the uh, uh, the rest of polygons. So, so rational polygons. Uh, let's see what can we do with them. Uh, why are they interesting? Uh, so, for one thing, so the main trick is unfolding, which, uh, which says that basically you can, if you start with a, yeah, if you start with a polygon, say, you know, if you know the, that if you have edges which are parallel, so if you start with a square or a rectangle, um, so the goal is to get into a, playing it uh, on a surface of, um, uh, sometimes, okay, a compact surface. If you pl if you play it in a square, basically, okay, so that's the the idea is that you can uh, instead of playing the polygon, playing the billiard, you can glue the parallel edges here and uh, get a torus, flat torus. And if you have a more complicated things, maybe you have a, a rect. A, 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 a triangle. Now, each time, instead of when you hit one edge, you can basically it is some um, some simple uh, argument that maybe I'm not going to go through. But basically, you the idea is that you can do the reflection along the edges and uh, get a, so maybe if this is uh, I don't know a two pi over ten, like you have to go ten times to get a decagon, and then I don't okay. And then you get a regular polygon, maybe in some cases. If, uh, and then you are doing the same thing. You are gluing the parallel edges of your polygon. And you get, say, in this case, you get a, if this is a, it's a decagon, then, then basically you get a surface of genus 2 with, uh, I put two singular points. But the reason is that once you do the gluing, uh, something weird happens to the edges uh, to the, the vertices of your n-gon. Sometimes the sum of the angles, so 
every, almost everywhere you have a structure which is a nice flat structure induced by C. And almost everywhere on your surface, you have this flat structure. But of course, the surface of when you glue these things, you can't have a, a flat structure on your surface. But, the, but then you have the, the uh, point is that you have finitely many points, which are basically some of your vertices, possibly. And then um, so at these points, the sum of the angles is more than 2 pi. Or maybe if you wanted to play this more interesting uh, L-shaped billiard, you would do this. You take the reflections of this, and then you do this. And these are the reflections. And then you do the gluing of the parallel lines. This goes to this, this goes to this, 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 this. And what you get is a surface. So instead of playing um, billiards um, on um, L-shaped billiard, what you are doing is that, actually in this case, you have one zero or one singularity. And uh, you see that one of the vertices will end up having a uh, total angle 2 pi. But uh, so these guys will not. And then the, instead of playing billiards here on, on your L-shaped uh, L billiard, basically you are looking at uh, lines starting from, um, say, some point straight lines on your, on your surface. And say you are looking at you are trying to find some uh, closed loops. So, but okay. So maybe I'll say a little bit more about this. So, so why are rational polygons interesting? Because so they give rise to interesting structures on, on a surface. Namely, uh, what is got, called after using unfolding, uh, they give you a flat structure on a genus, surface of genus G. G is a function of, uh, you know, the edges, the this m i n i pi. If they're the angles of the polygon m i n i pi, then there's a natural, there's a very simple formula for the genus of what you get by using the unfolding, and uh, so it gives you a flat structure on uh, on a surface of genus G of something. Yeah, it's it's something based on m, the, the the angles and um, and so in, and in this case, um, and basically what happens is that this is always, maybe this is not a bad example. So it looks all everywhere flat except for finitely many points which might come from uh, some of the vertices. And you get a lot of uh, structure. Um, you get basically C, you know, structure coming from C. Not good. <laughs> A complex structure, which is the same as the complex structure from C, and two foliations. So they give rise to a, um, and the complex structure will give you give rise to either uh, basically. Mo I mean, a lot of times it gives you a holomorphic one form. So now I call this. X, which, come, which came from the billiard, that gives you a holomorphic one form or quadratic differential. And then well that's, OK, holomorphic one form, if you are lucky and you, nev you always use, at the end of the day, when you always use some orientation uh, preserving, so you have an orientation everywhere on your surface. If you always use orientation preserving maps to glue the um, parallel edges, basically you get something you can say that the form, which is dz on C, will give you rise to a holomorphic one form on your surface. And if not, the form dz squared will give you what is called a quadratic differential. So quadratic differential is a form uh, of a quadratic differential dz squared. And in, case, in, in many cases, you get uh, f dz 
which is a holomorphic one form. So you get, basically, the complex structure is defined almost every, I mean, everywhere except for finitely many points. And by removal of singularities, you can extend it and get a complex, you get really a complex curve uh, by this billiard and the holomorphic one form. So you get a lot of um, structure. So this here, there is a notion of, uh, first of all, um, uh, area, just from area from C or holomorphic one form, uh, would give you a notion of area or quadratic differential. And um, also, say in the case of, say look at the case of holomorphic one forms, um, you, you get uh, two nice foliations from basically vertical and horizontal lines. So the questions that we had about uh, the orbits, you see that, OK, when you look at one orbit in some polygon, maybe these are all, forget about the blocking. These are all rational multiples of pi. When you do this, you go back. And at some point, maybe the, the, the curve will have some self-intersection. But when you, open, when you do this unfolding and you draw it on, this, on the corresponding surface, there, you'd never see a self-intersection in some sense. If you don't go through a singularity, it's something quite interesting. You start at some point and you just continue. And imagine that you have an infinite path of your billiard that it never goes through these singularities. Um, you have basically, you know, there's a notion of straight line, except for this point. And around this point, the notion of these are, you know, the trick is that here you have maybe these are straight lines, maybe from like um, like vertical lines. At um, everywhere except for this point, vertical line is a unique direction. And even direction if you're a holomorphic, dif uh, abelian differential. But um, basically, a, at least a line field, you have this. So you start here, and then you go around. And this line is an infinite line. And it's straight everywhere. And it doesn't have any self-intersection. So, so maybe you will say, OK, maybe it's something like this. You have, there are infinite lines without self-intersection. You can go and spiral around the simple closed curve. But it's not one of those. It goes, it really, it gets, yeah. it can be dense on the surface. So it's a, it's an, it's so, so already from an orbit of a billiard, you get into some interesting structure on a surface of, say, genus G, because, or say, genus 2 or higher genus. It's kind of a, a structure of a foliation, and the leaves of the foliation uh, can be dense or not. So for every direction, so maybe this is still about the, I keep these problems here. Uh, or, let's see. Let's keep them. So for still the structure is every theta, there is a foliation. Uh, say f theta which is all like it's the, like the real foliation, the real lines here, for example. Uh, the yellow lines will give you a foliation, the kind of a foliation of R by parallel lines, which is a measured foliation, meaning that you have a transverse measure defined uh, for the foliation on, uh, on the surface uh, measured. Foliation. And um, yep. So and um, so why? So that's so. This one thing is that you ha you get a rich structure really on the surface that you get by gluing parallel edges of polygons or this kind of unfolding uh, uh, unfolding of rational polygons that I didn't quite uh, tell you precisely what how to do it, but but it's quite uh, quite elementary and nice and. Um, but the other nice thing is that the, you can get, um, we can generalize this to the space. They all sit inside a nice space, which is the space of, say, if you are in the orientable case, like abelian or quadratic differentials. And um, 
And this space has rich structure. <laughs> but I'll, I'll say what I, what I mean by that. And um, OK, so let's see where we are. So if we have this nice rational polygons. You get a surface. You have some rich structures. But what does it have to do with the problems that uh, we were dealing with? We were, we were interested in closed orbits, dense orbits, equidistributed orbits, basically the paths of orbits. And the nice thing is that in general, I'm, I'm sure you've all seen it, maybe some talk when you were in high school maybe. But the nice thing is that you, know, you want to do a problem, you, you maybe you can't do it for one polygon, you change it, change the polygon and say that the two problems for two polygons are basically equivalent and then the second polygon has some nice other nice properties that you can deal with. But these problems, you know, you can change, you can start from a polygon which looks very nice uh, and you can, okay, maybe not, and you can deform this polygon in a way uh, and send it, imagine if you have a map from one polygon to another polygon and it preserve, and imagine that it preserves uh, so let me just do something very simple because I can't draw pictures. <laughs> okay, this is your polygon. So imagine that um, the map is very nice and it preserves all the structure that we are interested in. So we are interested in straight lines. Um, so, um, so, how, so what would be the map that preserves the orbits of elements and sends orbits to orbits? <coughs> Basically any linear map will will change and so any element that's, ori that's orientation preserving and I'm assuming that it also preserves the area just for, I mean it's, it's going to be GL2 but I just want to preserve something uh, later. So any, any kind of linear map in SL2 will preserve all the, the answer of all the questions that I asked you. <laughs> so imagine if you have SL2 maybe, maybe you acted by uh, the diagonal element. Now, and of course this could be, you could do it for some other more complicated polygon and make it into something that looks, uh, uh, you know, change, you can squeeze and stretch and you get the polygon which looks somehow different. But, uh, I don't know, this is, uh, okay, you do this, I don't know. Uh, but in any case, yeah. But in any case, the answer of these things would be the same for, for these two polygons because any closed loop in one, you can just apply phi and go to a closed loop to the other one. If something is dense here, you have a map, this will be dense there, so it doesn't matter. So the reason that we do this and we get these, uh, uh, you know, we, we glue these things, I mean, and it's also one reason that the, the rational po for rational polygons, things are easier is that, uh, Okay, in general, this, everything is invariant under SL2R, but you have here an action of uh, SL2R, but of course it changes this, possibly changes the, your structure. And you can see, like if you look at the complex structure that you get by gluing the parallel edges of a torus, so it's an elliptic curve, it's like when you act by phi, the complex structure is something else, except if you just rotate. If you, if you just rotate, it's like you have a polygon, and instead of putting it straight, you are, you know, moving it, rotating it on the, in the plane. Of course, nothing changes. It's the same, the same thing, but by the, the way we, we define things, you get a different surface, which is not very different from that. But the complex structure is the same. Or do you get a different structure on the same uh, uh, surface? So, so the nice thing is that uh, so there is a there is an SL2R action on so the space of rational polygons. Uh, I mean, I, I can't, I don't quite mean this uh, space. Uh, okay, of rational polygons and. Even if you look at each rational polygon, which give you a, an abelian uh, uh, differential on the space of abelian or quadratic differentials. Okay, but um, unfortunately, 
these two are not quite the same things. So there are abelian or quadratic differentials that you can get from, uh, so maybe I should define this, that you can get from rational polygons and there are ones which you cannot just because uh, uh, of some stupid dimension count. Uh, not every, so what I call, uh, so there's a space, uh, so this is a definition. So each rational polygon which will, will give rise to say, say an abelian differential, it doesn't really matter for, for this talk, it's abelian or quadratic, that gives rise to an element, it's an abelian differential say, uh, on X, which is the surface of say genus, fixing the genus, but A1 to AK are basically the multiplicities of zeros or singularities. So you can fix, you can look at all abelian, okay, you can look at the space of all abelian differentials on a, a surface of genus two or five or, so these are nice bundles defined over the moduli space of complex curves of a given genus. But you can also look at the abelian differential and each abel an abelian differential always defines a flat structure. Now you can look at the zeros of the abelian differential, of course, and look at the multiplicities, multiplicities of the zeros, but also phi dz basically defines, you write, write it as d of something, and this something here <laughs> will define a map to C for you locally, apart from the zeros of the abelian differential, or quadratic differential, whatever it is. <coughs> and, um, and basically, you can look at the space, which is the space of all abelian differentials, say, of with given set of zeros. Like you can say, I have the zeros uh, P1 to PK, of uh, type A1 to AK. For example, on a surface of genus two, if you have an abelian differential, you can have multiplicities. So this is zero, and this picture means that if you draw the uh, real lines uh, at one point, most points, you know, there, there is only one real line. You have this foliation. But at two points, which are the singularities, there are uh, four of them, or two of them, depending on how you count it, uh, will come out, or four of them here, and four of them here. And the rest of the place, basically, maybe if you continue one of these edges, uh, it would be dense on your surface. It goes everywhere and it never have any, um, and never has any kind of, any such intersection. So it's a weird structure in a way. Um, and so this is the space. And a lot of, po I mean, some polygons, uh, for example, uh, um, if you have one zero, you can, you can see this. It's easy to see that sum of AIs is equal to, to G minus two if, the, if you are on a surface of genus G. And um, so for example, this polygon, the L-shaped billiard, uh, will give you a surface of genus two if you do the reflection, let's do the unfolding trick. Uh-oh. And uh, you will have one singularity, which, you know, to have and the yellow lines are the images of these lines. Uh, okay, this, not quite, but almost. Yeah, this is a. And uh, basically, you have a, the flat structure, and this is a so this is a space which has dimension. So this is a very nice space. It has dimension. Maybe I'll just say a few words about it because we want to deal with this space later. It has dimension. 2G plus uh, K minus one, complex. And so if you have a holomorphic one form and it's locally and it's a, it has, okay, it's a space of almost flat structures with, with finitely many singularities, but it itself has a piecewise linear structure. So by body, what I mean is that imagine if you have a, pol in the case of polygons, so polygons, rational polygons will give you elements in this, in this bigger space. Um, but unfortunately not all the elements here will come from polygons. But in the case of polygons, imagine that if you wanted 
to find out all rational polygons, like the space of all po rational polygons, you could basically find a nice coordinate for them based on the lengths of the sides of your polygon, right? And here something similar happens. So there is an, when you have a holomorphic one form, you have a notion of length. Really, it's just a flat Euclidean length everywhere. You get a metric, which is a flat, you, comes from the flat length of uh, edges here. And um, basically, and you get, or if you want to be, if you want to do something fancy, you can say, oh, you intersect, you have two measured foliations, and it's related to the intersections with the transverse measures of the measured foliation. But if not, you can, if, if I give you an edge, you can uh, uh, give me a complex number, basically by integrating the holomorphic one form. So by using holonomies, you can choose enough lines and integrate one form uh, along these alpha i's. You can use 2g plus k minus one of them and integrate the one form and you get a coordinate system for, um, for, uh, for the space. So let me just uh, say a few things about this and then I guess I don't have to. And then next time we will uh, discuss more of the things. OK, so, so the space has piecewise linear structure. But it's something that uh, the interesting thing is that the SL2R also acts on the space of, of given A1 to AK, you get a natural SL2R action on, uh, on each of these spaces, which are piecewise linear. It's like you have some 2G plus D minus 1 pieces of the Euclidean space, and then you glue these things. You get some space which is not. Uh, not compact, but maybe next time I'll discuss this uh, more. And it has a measure mu, which is invariant. So the measure, the piecewise linear structure gives you a canonical nice measure, but the measure which is invariant under the SL2R action. And the interesting thing is that the measure is finite, which is due to, uh, I, I will discuss, I guess, next time the problems and what is due to whom. <laughs> Uh, Veach and Maser. And also, the interesting thing is that it's a nice, you know, you can say, oh, what, what can you say about this action? Because if you start from a point uh, which is a rational polygon, it will give you an element here. If you act by SL2, you move it around and you get a polygon which is, you know, if after you apply SL2, you apply one of these easy things which don't change the answer to the questions that you started with. And you're saying, OK, will you reach to the point that you have uh, nice properties there? So it, maybe if every point will have the dense orbit, then the behavior of all the rational polygons would be the same. So now we can, uh, maybe I'll discuss this a little bit at um, the beginning of the next lecture. But so uh, it's also known that the, the, so the SL2R will have the, the group there, which is generated by the, the, the it's called the Teichner geodesics, but, but maybe uh, the, for now I haven't justified why to call this the diagonal elements and the nilpotent elements, uh, unipotent elements. It's called UT and this GT. GT and UT both, uh, they act ergodically on uh, basically every connected component of H. So that's a good sign. At least the generic uh, element will go everywhere when you act by SL2. The problem is that rational polygons are not generic. They are um, lower dimensional things. So even if you can say, so whatever, a lot of statements about uh, generic elements in H A1, AK, you can't say anything about a rational polygon because it's not a generic element. And um, so I think maybe uh, I'll finish here. Next time I, I'll discuss more of the known results here. And uh, basically what I want to talk about in the second and third lecture is uh, statements about uh, <coughs> the, the actions of this group, ETE minus T, and the 
not ut but the upper triangular matrices on ha1 to ak and tell you what the problems are basically there's, there's an analogy that people refer to all the time between these spaces and either homogeneous spaces or or negatively curved manifolds but um, but this analogy is not so useful in some sense because it's not compact the uh, the non compact i mean the the infinity parts of these are quite complicated and um, it's not a homogeneous space so there's not much you can uh, do if you just want to deal with homogeneous spaces but we want to discuss basically the dynamics of these two and and some of the known results and the things that we get by um, looking at these um, at these questions and i'll yeah i will basically discuss some of my joint work with uh, Alex Eskin and, and some other collaborators, but maybe I'll discuss it next time. For now, I just this time this time this lecture was just problems, <coughs> and next time maybe discuss some of the methods. And okay, thank you.